Hello and welcome to this webinar from IEDB. I am Roddy Miller, one of the founders of IEDB, and I'm very pleased to be hosting today's event with Paul McDonough Smith from MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, before I bring Paul in, I'm going to uh, just uh, do a a quick, a quick introduction, which will um, also allow a few other people to, to join us um, who may not have come on right at the top of the hour. Um, it's exciting to be back in webinar mode. This is, in fact, our first webinar of 2021. And I said at the uh, after our last webinar, um, just before Christmas in 2020, that 2021 was going to be a, a radically different year to, to 2020, and it was going to knock our socks off. I'm not quite sure whether um, we, we have got to that sock knocking off stage yet, but um, I, I think we're on a better trajectory now in, in global terms around the pandemic, and uh, hopefully that will allow us all to start meeting um, in the not too distant future in, in small groups anyway, and uh, a little less reliance on the screen interface that we've uh, all had a lot of over the last few months. Um, however, it is the screen interface that we have today, and I um, am delighted to invite back Paul, who, who in fact was our speaker on, on, the, on the last event, um, and he started his introduction uh, exploration around the theme of algorithmic business thinking, um, how businesses and managers uh, need to understand the world of more complex technology in order to get the best out of uh, performance from their businesses and indeed um, for themselves too. Uh, and we are fascinated. That was a, a you know, a, a really interesting angle and perspective. And so we've asked Paul to come back and dig a little deeper around that because in the 60 minutes we have available to us in these uh, webinars, there's only um, a limited amount of time available to, uh, to explore. Uh, and particularly what we're looking at today is the, the double helix structure that uh, Paul uses as his metaphor, where the, uh, the human uh, set of skills need to entwine in the same way as the technology technology skills do and how they feed off each other and support each other. Um, and so it, it is with that that um, area of, of, of that interaction between the two that, that we are looking at today, which it fits so, so very closely with what we do here at IEDP, which is largely looking at the human side. We're, we're not a, a technology platform, uh, but the, a, a, as, we, as we continue, we see that those two, two things are, are very closely in, interconnected. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Paul now. Paul is uh, a, a senior lecturer in the technology department at MIT, uh, the Sloan School of Management, and he leads um, a couple of executive education programs there that he, he will talk us through, but primarily around this algorithmic business thinking um, and, um, and and on the digital learning strategy. So um, without any, any, any further uh, talk from me, Paul, why, why don't I just hand over to you? Because that's really who people are here to listen to. Well, Roddy, thank you very much for, for that uh, in introduction. I can assure everybody that I haven't actually been sitting here on Zoom uh, since December. You know, I, I did kind of take a little break for, for Christmas, um, but, but I am <clears throat> very pleased and, and, and kind of privileged to be with you and to be the, uh, the first webinar of the, of the new year of 2021. So um, I believe um, from what I heard from Roddy before we began, and, and there are a number of people who actually attended the one just before Christmas. And so I, I shan't kind of uh, go over old ground too much but I do want to make sure we have a little bit of a, a level set with regard to algorithmic business thinking and allow us together to go on a little bit of a voyage of discovery over the next 
50, 55 minutes or so. And um, Roddy, I, I gather you will kind of collect questions in, in the chat window and kind of interrupt me, should there be any kind of need to do so? Or... Yes, I should, I should have said um, in, in my introduction, Paul, that um, it, you, you'll speak for about 20, 25 minutes or so, after which we'll have, have, a, have a brief chat and, and then we open it up to, oh, to, to questions from, from people. So um, please, please do you know, you gather your questions and, um, and put them in the chat or through the, the Q&A panel and, um, and, and we will take from there and, and open up and, and involve as many people as we can. Perfect. And then if um, for, you know, if by, by any reason, for any reason, there are questions that we don't get around to, Roddy, please feel free at the end to send them to me and I, I kind of commit to getting back answers back to you within 24 hours to, to those questions. Fabulous. Not the right answers, but, you know, answers of such, <laughs> such quality that I can kind of muster. Okay, so um, perhaps if, if I just just give a quick introduction as to, as to who, who I am. Uh, Roddy was very kind and introduced the fact that I'm a senior lecturer in the IT group here at the MIT Sloan School of Management. I also wear another hat where I'm the digital capability leader in the Office of Executive Education here at MIT Sloan. And that, that's kind of exciting as well in, in the sense that I'm responsible for our growing portfolio of digital programs. Um, I'm responsible for our experimentation, which is particularly interesting. You know, we kind of delve into areas including AI, machine learning, AR, VR, robotics, virtual worlds. We've, we've done a lot in those areas over the last 10 years or so. And then the third part of the third leg of my stool <laughs> in, in that regard is with digital strategy. So I, I help out kind of both within the Sloan School, but, but also have the opportunity across campus to participate uh, across the Institute, in fact, with the whole conversation around digital strategy, which as I'm sure is the case for all of you, today is, um, is a very pertinent and, and, and kind of important set of discussions. So what I'd like to do um, is firstly begin with something I was taught to do at the beginning of presentations by somebody far greater than I might ever even pretend to kind of want to be, a chap uh, called Professor Patrick Winston, the late Patrick Winston who um, was an AI pioneer at, at, at MIT, uh, CSAIL, the Computer Science and AI Laboratory, for uh, 50, 50 plus years. Um, and he used to do this thing where every year, every year, it's called IAP, and all of the faculty, we have the opportunity to teach a new program or a new topic that we wish, that we wish to kind of road test, if you will. And he, he, um, he, he taught, he took his option to be uh, a presentation called How to Speak, OK, and if you ever get the chance, either on open courseware or just kind of Googling and YouTubing around, I, I really highly recommend that you check it out because it, it's one of those kind of uh, almost life changing types of presentations to watch. The funny thing about it was it um, one of the funny things that these uh, IAP presentations are supposed to happen once. He did the same one every year for 40 years. <laughs> So uh, you can you can tell by that standing alone that it was um, pretty compelling stuff. Okay, and what he, what he what he says at the beginning of his um, how to speak presentation is that you should always make an enablement promise. You know, tell people the things that you're going to tell them during the course of your talk, and you should you should always resist the temptation for any jokes early on. Okay, um, he said it's okay to tell a joke towards the end or at the end, but um, don't risk it at the beginning. So I'm not going to. I'm going to follow Patrick's advice and I'm going to not do that. But if we do have time at the end, Roddy, you can remind me perhaps to kind of share a little kind of joke of sorts. So what, 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 what are we going to cover? Uh, what I'm going to do um, to bring everybody to, to a level kind of setting is provide a, a welcome introduction to the concept of algorithmic business thinking. And then we're going to move directly into the, the, the main course, if you will, which is around the concept and the construct of a double helix for the digital the digital economy and i believe the the digital age now this is based on um, my research and my, my work but but also a number of my colleagues at mit and I'll, I'll tell you more about that when when we get there one of the key points here is, is that somewhat interestingly perhaps you'll see or you'll find that it's actually a series of human-centric genes or proteins 
that are holding the structure, the twisted ladder kind of structure of DNA in place. And then what we'll do, we'll move from there to uh, a, 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 an associated or kind of adjacent type of area around what I call a 3E model. Again, this is an, an algorithmic business thinking concept around exploration, experimentation, and evolution. And I'm sure you can see the linkage there with double helix and the genetic kind of concept. So let's, let's get straight into it, shall we? So welcome to algorithmic business thinking. So let's start um, perhaps at the beginning or close, close to it. What in fact, or what indeed is algorithmic business thinking? So as you can read here, it's a series of interconnected insights, frameworks, and models that quite simply enable you to break complex business challenges and, and some easier ones, of course, but particularly complex business challenges, break them down into a series of smaller parts such that you can work upon them and then recombine them as opportunities, okay? And so how do we actually go about this? So there, there are four fundamental cornerstones to this um, principle or concept of algorithmic business thinking. And a number of you kind of listening here will recognize that they come from computational kind of uh, thinking or computer science. And they are, as you can see here, decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction and algorithms. And I'm not going to overly belabor the point. You, you, can, you can have a look at the, um, the recording of the webinar that we did before Christmas, but, but, but I will just share one or two sentences about each of these. So decomposition, I think, is, is, is quite self-explanatory in, in the sense that it's almost the concept of problem reduction, breaking something down into its smaller or constituent or component parts. Um, Personally, I, I find that very, very useful um, in problem solving in general, both um, professionally speaking and personally. You know, th those times where you wake up in a cold sweat at half past three in the morning, uh, thinking about a business problem or a problem about a house you're buying or something, you know, not able to get back to sleep. Um, my, my kind of approach there is this idea of decomposition, breaking it down into smaller parts, continuing to break it down until I find one I can start to fix and then hopefully having, <clears throat> excuse me, a bit of a domino effect where I can begin to kind of resolve problems either on my own or in my team or teams um, in, in, a, in, in a sequence. Pattern recognition, um, the second of our cornerstones, is very important because it, it actually kind of drives a number of efficiencies and uh, allows us to be quite effective in the sense that if we can recognize a, a solution or a pattern, either within a problem set that we're directly working within or another one separate, then we can hopefully transplant that particular pattern to positive impact and effect in the problems or on the problems with the problems that we're working upon. Now, abstraction, that the third of our cornerstones is perhaps, is perhaps the kind of odd person out here in, in that it doesn't at first glance kind of seem to be what it actually is. OK, so <laughs> abstraction kind of implies a certain vagueness or something along those lines. But 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 in reality, it's quite the opposite. Abstraction in a computational sense is the the ability to actually filter out or find the noise in the signal. So filter out the unnecessary details such that we actually end up with clarity of problem statement or clarity of perspective. I think in, in a world where increasingly we're kind of um, avalan avalanched upon, if you can say that, um, by data, then this, this idea of being able to focus on what's important, being able to separate the wheat from the chaff, the noise from the signal, or signal from the noise, is a very useful tool. The fourth of our cornerstones might appear to be quite straightforward and, and simple. Algorithms, okay? So a number of us will kind of have coded or programmed and, you know, done our Python thing and all the rest of it. But here within, within the context of algorithmic business thinking, algorithms actually equals humans and machines. So whereas in a computational sense, we would kind of look at algorithms through, um, th th through that mathematical type of programming perspective, here what we're doing is recognizing that 
where we are today in the digital economy, we have a range of evolving partnerships and relationships, rebalancings, recalibrations between humans and machines that mean fundamentally we have the opportunity to work in partnership. Okay, so please, when, when, we're, when we're thinking and talking about algorithms in the context of ABT, let, let's kind of think of it as that human and machine kind of idea working together. Now, as you've already kind of imagined or kind of uh, guessed, I'm, um, I'm pretty prone to stealing ideas from other people. Okay, so here's yet, yet another one. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's, it's from a friend of Patrick Winston's, uh, a chap called Marvin Minsky. He also was a, an incredible MI, MIT professor and AI pioneer. And he had this thing that I thought was quite clever. He had lots of things that were quite, well, lots of things that were very clever. Um, one of which was this, this term that he coined around a suitcase word. And by this, he, he, means, he, he means kind of words that escape easy definition. And, and of course, AI is one of those, yeah? Um, what he's kind of getting at is, is, is the idea that certain words have quite a lot packed into them. And I've tried to take that kind of concept, that term, um, and play it to my advantage a little bit with regard to algorithmic business thinking. So quite deliberately, what we, what we do on my ABT, algorithmic business thinking program and courses, is that we, as we go through the program, we pack a suitcase, okay? And we pack the suitcase with lots of hopefully interesting things those insights, those frameworks, and those models that were mentioned in the definition. In practical terms, though, it's a, a toolkit. So we, we have a series of tools that we put into our suitcase. Um, those can be things like our, our technology chessboard, which you know, we referenced on, the, on the, last, uh, the, the last webinar. We have a periodic table of digital and human elements that perhaps you know, I might have the chance in the future even to speak at more length about, Roddy, which is kind of interesting because it replaces the, um, the, the kind of the idea of the element of hydrogen with the digital element of data, okay? So in our periodic table of digital and human elements, hydrogen is number one and we work from there. And then just to, to share another one of our tools, it's this idea of minding the gap. So as we move from the industrial further into the digital economy, we need to mind the gap, um, the gap uh, in our workforce, the, the, the gap in our strategy, leadership, management, the way we interact, various levels of seniority in our organizations with our customers, clients, et cetera. Critically though, um, and particularly at a time, the time that we're in at the moment, we should also be looking into the gap to see if there's some ready-made innovation that we can pluck and use to our advantage, okay? So in addition to a toolkit, uh, algorithmic business thinking in its suitcase represents a mindset, okay? So part of this mindset is um, very much around this idea of, of exploration-led leadership, okay? So I'm, I'm kind of increasingly keen on the idea of what does it really take to be elite digital professionals today, okay? Now that sounds a bit kind of sales forcey, but, but I don't mean it in that context. I mean across all business functions. And where, where it actually comes from is an appreciation of really what we've been going through over the last, the, the last 12 months with the pandemic. Um, I've heard people, and I've been part of the conversation myself at, 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 at MIT, where we've kind of, you know, so, somewhat kind of, um, somewhat, somewhat of a resigned type of tone, kind of said, well, crikey, uh, we've, we've actually kind of gone through 10 years of digital transformation in 10 months. You know, how did that happen? Yeah, type of idea. And, and kind of lamented the fact that for the 10 years before that, we seem to have made 10 months progress, if you see, if you see what, 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 what I mean. And the reason I think this exploration-led leadership idea is important is because as we move through and past the pandemic, and, and we will, of course, there will be um, some for, form of type of recovery and the, the digital transformation that we all recognize in all, our, in, in all of our organizations will be visible in those of our clients and customers as well. So how are we gonna bridge the gap, yeah? Um, not just mine the gap, but how are we gonna bridge the gap between kind of the various levels of digital transformation? So I found myself thinking about what it requires to be uh, these elite digital professionals. 
And one of the things that very much struck me was that we've often heard this mantra of the need to move from command and control into more cultivate and collaborate type of leadership styles. And, and, I, and I think that's great. Um, and at the same time, I also recognize that I've set myself a mental alarm that whenever I hear the word control, I kind of Pavlovian kind of way go to explore. Okay. So I've been trying to train myself over the last kind of three or four months to kind of become more exploratory, to explore my, I've always been quite good at exploring my failures, you know, I have quite a few of them to, to kind of look into and, and to kind of, um, but I've never been so good at looking at, at successes or kind of things that have gone well. And I, I'm kind of teaching myself um, how, to, how to do that. And, and really kind of whenever I find myself in a management perspective, looking to try and control, trying to explore the situation a bit better. And, and maybe we'll come on to this towards the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Now, the final thing that's packed into this suitcase is, um, is, is kind of the digital economy's version of 501 Spanish verbs, conjugation for the kind of unprepared type of idea, yeah. And by this, I, I mean to suggest very seriously um, for a moment, that we very much need to kind of build a common digital language across our organizations, across our networks, uh, a digital language, a common digital language that's accessible to everybody, no boundaries, borders, barriers. Um, it's about inclusion and kind of bringing people in. Like any digital language or any language, in fact, it, it's going to be a bit tricky to move from the reading and writing to the speaking. You know, there's going to be a leap somewhere. We're going to have to hang out with people we don't normally hang out with. If we're non-technical people, then, you know, we're going to have to hang out with some of the technical people, speak the language. If we're a technical person, then we're going to have to hang out with the non-technical people to understand what this means for them as well. My primary kind of inspiration in this area, again, stolen from somebody much greater than I could ever hope to even think about, Noam Chomsky, who's kind of point kind of surprised me the first time I heard it, but the idea that, that the primary function of language isn't actually to communicate, but rather to link interfaces, okay? And so at, at a time when we have almost exponential growth of interfaces between humans and humans, and machines and machines and humans and machines, I think it's quite interesting to be kind of looking further and deeper into the, the prospects and possibilities of a digital, common digital language, okay? So all of this almost brings us in to the point around double helix and our algorithmic business thinking genes. And where, where I'm kind of driven from here is, is kind of almost, almost the power of paradox. So, so, so paradox is pretty, pretty interesting, isn't it? You know, the, the, this idea of contradictory forces kind of uh, with, with a tension playing on each other. Um, very often uh, at a time of kind of, you know, free speech, hate speech, fast, slow, all the rest of it, uh, it, it can be really interesting to explore some of the paradoxes ar around us. And I, in, 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 in kind of my context, in the context of my, of my work at MIT Sloan, over a number of years, I've, I've kind of bumped into and bounced into a number of kind of paradoxes related to the human and machine relationships. I'll, I'll just share two of them with you here that kind of lead me to one that we're attributing to algorithmic business thinking. And these are the um, Polanyi and the Moravec paradoxes. You, you, you may have come across them yourselves. The, the Polanyi paradox suggests that we know more than we can tell, okay? This idea of implicit versus tacit information. So I, in full transparency, I'm sitting here in my office in Bilbao at the moment. Um, I could tell you exactly kind of what I've got on my desk and, and the rest of it. But for the life of me, I'm not sure I could tell you how I actually drove here through the traffic earlier this morning, okay? So we know more than we can tell, which is of course a bit of a problem in the AI field um, in the sense that in order to automate, we need to be very explicit with the information we give to the machines so they can undertake the tasks. Um, Polanyi himself kind of suggests that maybe um, there's a strong possibility that the millions, if not billions of years of evolutionary biology, biology, evolutionary stuff that we went through has actually helped us in this regard, okay? Now, the other paradox I wanted to mention, uh, the Marovec uh, paradox, suggests that 
oftentimes what's difficult for humans is in fact easier for machines and vice versa. So the, the idea that kind of a computer can beat um, Karpov or Kasparov or uh, a Go champion, chess champion, poker champion, um, in a sense, given, given this paradox, perhaps isn't so surprising. On the, on the opposite side of things, I've done a lot of work in, in, in robotics and the, the kind of frustrations <laughs> involved trying to get a robot to walk up a flight of stairs or to actually call the lift or the elevator kind of play to this as well. Incredibly difficult to create robotics and computer machines that are, that are able to actually have the sensory motor skills of a one or two year old human child type of idea. And so, Building on these paradoxes, I, I began to kind of recognize from an algorithmic business thinking perspective that as we look at the sustainable companies that are, that are being created and going to be created within the digital economy, they appear to be increasingly reliant on human centric skills versus only technical or STEM skills. And I thought that was that was kind of interesting. So in building this um, in, in building this double helix, where we have the the twisted ladder, of course, inspired by the the, the brilliance of uh, Watson and, and Crick, um, we, we we actually have the the rungs of the ladder are actually these human centric genes or, or proteins, if you will. And I'm just going to spend a, a few minutes, if that's okay, just walking you through them. These aren't all of them. Um, but there, there are a series of, of ones that I wanted to, to bring to your attention. And, and in fact, what, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll straight from the, the get go kind of highlight a couple that I think are absolutely critical. They're, they're, they're critical based on the work um, that I've been doing um, and the, the research that, that I've been part of. Also, um, the work that I've seen uh, Professor Thomas Malone, uh, Superminds and the Centre for Collective Intelligence. Um, Eric Brynjolfsson, uh, the work that he and Andy McAfee, the research they put into their latest book, Machine Platform Crowd, and the work that Eric subsequently has kind of continued in his new role at Stanford. Creativity. It's interesting, isn't it, that I, I've, I've worked a lot, I think it's interesting, I've worked a lot over the last four or five years in the AI and machine learning areas in, in, in particular, and when, when I boil it all down, what one of my kind of major observations is that our user experience has nowhere near caught up with the capability of the technologies that we've created. OK, so if we think about that, it's, it's kind of interesting because it suggests that human creativity can actually create incredible business opportunities here if we could just get closer to building the user experience, the products, the services, the solutions that take advantage of the capability of the technology, we, we can create completely new kind of sets of opportunities and business models, okay? So creativity, I think, is incredibly important. Another one that, that I think we should kind of highlight or I should have kind of put in bold here is, might surprise you, compassion, okay? And I think as we move forward in our organizations and further and further into the digital economy, this idea of compassion or this human centric capability um, of, of, of compassion is going to be truly key. Compassion for other human beings, for the places and the spaces that we share, empathy for the experiences and, and the things that we have in common, hopefully over our differences, our similarities more than our, our differences. I think that's going to be very, very important. The, the third one that I would kind of draw to our, our attention is actually the last one, uh, this idea of consilience. And, and, and again, I've kind of borrowed this um, from a much greater source than, my, than myself, a chap called E.O. Wilson, um, the Harvard uh, professor, actually the world's leading authority on ants, believe it or not. Um, and in his 1998, I think it was 1998 book, Consilience, uh, which you know, again, if you, if you haven't had the opportunity to read it, I, I strongly recommend kind of, you know, getting onto Amazon or kind of your, your favorite kind of vendor of choice and, and getting a copy of this. Because it, in, in this book, he, he really argues incredibly compellingly for the reunification, the consilience, the unification, the unity 
of the humanities and the sciences. Okay, and so a very a, a very compelling kind of argument that in order to in, in in order to make advantage or take advantage of the opportunities we have in front of us, we are going to have to kind of go back in time a little bit and accept that the human humanities and the sciences fields that are often appear to be at philosophical odds with one another are actually a lot more linked than we might at first glance be prepared to accept, okay? So I, I've pulled out kind of three here, the creativity, the compassion, and the consilience. Curiosity, I think obviously we, we, we can see, can't we, that this is almost kind of the, the rocket fuel of, of, <laughs> of our kind of innovation, this sense of human curiosity. Critical thinking, um, when you read books like Daniel Kahneman's Fast and Slow around the two systems, we, we have a sense of the importance and, and the relevance of critical thinking in our organizations. Uh, collaboration, I'll just say a couple of things about this. Um, collaboration is, is, is a word that kind of fills me kind of with a, a sense of dread, actually. Um, it's, it's one of those words that appears very nice, kind of soft and uh, you know, touchy-feely, but, but in fact, real collaboration is quite hard. I, I would argue that there are at least two, two versions of collaboration. There is the risk-free and the risk-sharing collaboration. Risk-free, I think like everybody else I quite like, you know, a cup of coffee, maybe kind of a, a macchiato, frappe, whatever, whatever you kind of your poison is. Um, some nice conversations, some sharing of information. The risk-sharing version though, is where you're actually working in a, in a team of teams where you're in different reporting lines, perhaps even different organizations, and you have shared commitments and, and have to build trust very quickly and get jobs done, even when perhaps 70% of um, your kind of similarities are not overlapping, okay? So co collaboration is a very interesting one. Communication, I, I've kind of mentioned a little bit around the idea of digital language, but, but, but I think the importance of communication in general, yeah, we need to make sure that we are communicating and exploring the right ways to communicate with kind of humans and machines. And, and, and also I have community here because I think creating communities where we have an active and positive flow of information is incredibly valuable and important as well. So really, this is the introduction or some of the main points around this double helix kind of idea, a twisted ladder where the rungs are actually human-centric genes that are holding the, the ladders together and unifying our physical and digital business worlds, okay? So as, as I said at the beginning, I, I would also take a little bit of time to focus on the 3E kind of idea, the exploration, experimentation, and evolution. And the, uh, the picture here of, of kind of the blue marble is, is actually a photograph that was shared with me by some people I've been doing some work with at, at NASA. Um, a, a chap that, that we've been working with, that I've been working with, they're very for, fortunate to, to have the opportunity, a chap called Jim, um, Jim Garner. He, he, he actually talks about not a final frontier, but a forever frontier. He makes a really compelling case um, around space exploration that I think is, is very relevant to the way that we might think about the digital uh, economy and the digital society. So he, he, speaks, he speaks about the fact that, crikey, we all need to accept that we are in space, yeah? It's part of us. You know, we, we find ourselves, you know, a couple of times a year in the back garden looking up at a comet or, or kind of an eclipse of some sort or, or something. And we have a tendency to think that's somewhere else, that's space, planets, are, are, are something else and somewhere else and somebody else's business. But, but, but of course, we all live in space as well. Yeah, you know, those, those kind of people looking down, or but those people, those entities, those bodies, <laughs> those mo microbes looking down from, 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 from Mars and from other places, what do they see? They, they see us, for, for, for them, we're in space. And the reality is, of course, we all exist within that same system, okay? And I think it's kind of high time, if not kind of after time, that, that we actually accept the same reality with the digital economy. Um, 
the digital economy is all around us, like space. We, we exist within it. We are part of its system. Interestingly, though, it's, I, I think in, in the way that, that NASA speak about Forever Frontier, I, I think digital is the same. I, I think the possibilities are endless. Uh, the opportunities are endless. Um, those of you who kind of work in roles where you, you make things um, or even sell things or pretty much do anything these days, it never really finishes, does it? You, you never kind of put a bow on the box and send it out to a customer and say, that's the end of that, I'll have a cup of tea now and everything's gonna be fine. No, because of the data, because of the hydrogen in our kind of digital uh, periodic table, everything is always growing. We have feedback, we have information, we have next releases, we have bang, bang, bang. We live within a forever frontier. And we have some choices to make of course, um, as, as, as is always the case. Um, we, we can kind of take this as, a, as kind of somewhat of a pressurizing thing, like a pressure cooker of sorts, or as, as I would prefer in, in kind of my thoughts around creating elite digital professionals, we need to, to explore it. We need to find a little bit of that nine-year-old uh, nine back in ourselves, yeah? Kind of standing next to, to our kind of parents in, in the garden, looking up at the stars and kind of, thinking anything is possible, knowing anything is possible type of idea. So I think there's an inspiration that can be taken, not just from NASA, but from our work in the digital economy and the digital areas. The inspiration is important because it kind of helps us um, apply more energy and effort to, to our activities. It gives us that spark very often, along with diversity to, to innovate. It allows, to, uh, allows us to create new connections, new interconnections, and make new discoveries. And this leads into kind of the, the next part of this, of course, that if you, if you will accept that we, we, we all need to become more explorers or explore more, what are we going to do whilst we're exploring? I, th I think a good idea is that we experiment. Um, there's the Alan Kay uh, line that's the, the best way to predict the future is to create it. At Alan Kay, the Turing Award winner, um, Atari, HP, Disney, uh, Xerox Park, <laughs> the list goes on and on. Yeah, kind of, he, he, um, he, he kind of didn't just coin the phrase, you know, in Marvin Minsky kind of terms, he carried that suitcase around with him everywhere. Yeah, he, he did it time and time again. And so the, the, um, the bullet points here are just, some very practical kind of um, bullet points that I've taken from the dozens, if not hundreds of uh, experiments that we've run at, at, at MIT Sloan. Super important, frame your problem. And again, this comes back to algorithmic business thinking uh, 101, yeah, should we say the decomposition. Make sure you know what problem you're fixing. <laughs> Make sure you have defined the problem before you get into fixing mode. Um, the next one might seem kind of somewhat strange for somebody who lives his life in, in, in a digital kind of uh, domain. I'm, I'm kind of more into compasses than GPS when it comes to experimentation. Set yourself a direction, be okay with a, an element of ambiguity. Um, I, I kind of joked earlier kind of about exploring successes and failures. Yeah, on, on a personal level, I've had lots and lots and lots of failures, but I can look, look at those through another lens and actually say, well, really, they weren't that big a set of failures because every single one I learned something from, okay? So set, set your direction and be prepared as you're kind of walking around just to check your compass and make sure you're actually kind of um, heading in the right direction or resetting your course, okay? You can tack and jibe. You don't always have to go in a straight line, okay? Um, the next point around team of teams, I, I think is absolutely critical. Um, in the, in, the, in the digital economy and critical to the idea of algorithmic business thinking. It doesn't matter how many smart people we have in our organizations, there are always a, a lot more smarter people outside of them. Um, this idea of connecting with the crowd, connecting the core to the crowd is, is very, very important. My, my kind of cold sweats um, with regard to collaboration are driven by, by, by this reality that at least 70% at least of the teams that I work in that they're not my MIT colleagues, or if they are, my MIT colleagues are in a minority. 
I work in a lot of different teams. And I think all of us, as we kind of move further into the digital economy, can expect that to be the case. Uh, you, you, shan't be, you won't be surprised to hear that I, I would recommend being data driven. The interesting theory about, thing about being data driven in experimentation is to engineer in your data requirements at the beginning, not try and kind of do so at the end. OK, so be aware of kind of who your stakeholders are, what they're looking for, what type of information uh, and in what format they need it before you start your experiments. Uh, this idea of staying positive, and, and, and I don't mean in, um, in a kind of annoying type of way. I, I, I just mean kind of embracing the reality that in the digital economy, uh, as, as, we, as we move forward, we, we, we're, we're going to wake up every morning with 10 or 20 problems in our mailbox, okay? If, if you want to look at them that way, or you can look at them the other way and say, well, kind of let's get cracking. Which one of these is an opportunity for, for that we can explore for growth and development? We've all seen kind of lifelong learning um, and learning in general to be very important. I, I would kind of flip it a tiny bit and, and, and say that our organizations need to become teaching organizations, not just learning organizations. For, for two reasons. Firstly, um, in my personal experience, I've never really known anything. I've never really learned anything until I've had to try and teach it. Okay. And then also because it helps create becoming teachers internally helps create these communities that I think are so important and boosts the flow of positive information, knowledge, identity, experience through our networks. That the last one uh, should be the first one, really. It, it's about caring more. Don't ask me why or, or how, but, but I've learned over the last kind of 20, 25 years that when you really care about what you're making, what you're doing, who you're interacting with, they can tell, okay? It doesn't matter how, 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 how kind of digital or technical or technological the solution might be, the work that goes into it, the people who are using it will be able to tell. So, so I think that's a very important lesson. Now, Paul, well, well, can I, yes. can we, can I give you uh, uh, five minutes on that? Yes, so indeed. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. This, this is, this is my last slide. So, um, in terms of the third E of, of our kind of three E algorithmic business thinking model, this, this kind of relates back to the double helix and those human centric genes. I, I hope that what we're constructing with these human centric genes isn't just the kind of source code to create the next generation of sustainable companies in the digital economy. I hope what we're creating is a very strong and compact molecule that can actually be the basis for evolution, okay? So, you know, we, we've, we've kind of maybe been through this before in, in terms of we've had industrial revolutions, we've had revolutions. I, I don't see this experience, this, this thing we're going through at the moment with the digital economy to be a revolution in the sense that I don't think we necessarily need to be throwing things out or throwing them away. I think there is um, an opportunity to evolve our positions on most things, okay? And it makes me think back to the, the kind of the Charles Darwin, the uh, British naturalist, of course, the, the, the whole idea of um, it not necessarily being the strongest that survive, but the most adaptable, okay? So I think that's, that's a message that we should very much take with us. And, and maybe one that's kind of lived in his own life, if, if you will. Um, Roddy might know this better than I, but um, was, was he 21, 22 years of age in 1831 when he boarded the um, HMS Beagle? He, he went on his own voyage. He went exploring. He went experimenting. He came back 1836. Then I think it was 1859. He published, he published The Origin of Species, the evidence that he collected the evidence. He, he had a problem, didn't he? He had this complex problem around trying to figure out evolution. He deconstructed it, he decomposed it, he looked for the patterns, he abstracted the kind of the signal from the noise. And then he wrote his algorithm, the, the book, Origin of, Spe of Species. The algorithm that had was the evidence to show the step by step kind of sequences that proved the answer to his question, okay? So maybe, maybe another gene here is a bit of patience, yeah, because it doesn't always happen overnight, okay? So ultimately, what, what, what I'm kind of um, trying to argue is, is that in order to unlock the potential of the digital economy, 
we don't only need AI machine learning and kind of STEM type skills, but we, we need a fundamental human centricity, creativity, compassion, and above all, a drive towards unity and unification. So I think I, think I might have given you 30 seconds back, Roddy. Yeah. Unmute myself. Um, brilliant. No, thank you so much. Um, that was, you know, the, the, a, a, a huge, a huge amount in there. But there's some really strong themes um, through the middle, la la like a double helix, perhaps, um, um, going going through the core of it. Um, and I am I'm really keen to get the views of of our, you know, our, our listeners, our, our audience, but to, to engage in this and and um, and, sh and share your thinking and questions with Paul. But just just before I draw on some of those, um, it, it, you, you're very strong, obviously, on that that sort of human centric, that idea of the rungs being the, these human centric genes. Uh, and a lot of that, I, I think you, you touched on the idea and we spoke just before we went live around this idea of, of how some of those sort of hu human elements, perhaps the humanities elements of learning um, are just as important or uh, for people to be acquiring as the STEM science, science technology uh, and maths um, subjects that, that that can do the practical technical part of it um, and, and I think there's something around there that those two themes that you speak about uh, uh, around curiosity and exploring um, uh, and the experimenting and, and I wonder how much you see I mean obviously you're coming from an academic background or an academic environment but I, I wonder how much you see in, in clients that you work with and, uh, and organizations and I'd be interested to know from the audience too how comfortable people are in their work environment doing this, exploring uh, and experimenting, how much room they feel they have to fail and learn from that, and, 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 and how much they think their organizations are, are teaching organizations. Can, can I make a quick, um, I'll make a quick kind of point about this, and then perhaps, if, you know, if, if anybody would like to kind of add a, a question or a thought to it, please kind of really share it with me. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to pretend it's, it's kind of always easy. Yeah, I mean, when, when people speak about a shift in leadership styles within the digital economy from that command and control hierarchical approach to a more decentralized, cultivate, collaborate, cooperate type of model, it's, it's kind of almost recognizing in itself that there's a transition to be made. It's really hard to let go of power and, and control. Yeah, in, in the sense that it's really hard to let go of the control, either because you think it's your responsibility, yeah, that because of your job role, or you think you've earned it, you think you deserve it, et, et cetera, et cetera. However, as, as I was kind of talking about before, there's a paradox at play here that I truly believe, based on what I've seen, not just what I, what I think or hope, but what, what, what I've seen, the paradox at play is that if you're able to kind of let go of a bit of control and move to an exploratory or an exploration mode, you will get that influence back and more. Okay. Um, this, this idea, you, you, we all have to understand what we can control and what we can't to begin with. Okay. And there are a number of aspects of the way that we work within the digital economy that quite, quite frankly, from a management and leadership perspective, we would be better served to, to understand that, we, we can't control those things, explore them. Explore with your people, explore with the machines, treat the machines as one of your team, yeah? Um, and what, what I personally have found, if, if it's not oversharing, is that with, with my own team, but by allowing them to explore, keep giving them the guardrails, I'm not talking about abdication of any responsibilities, but setting the guardrails, um, the world's pretty fuzzy. <laughs> the barriers and the borders are pretty fuzzy at the moment anyway. So why, why necessarily fight against it? Move with it a tiny bit, explore and help. And, and, and I find that you, you get an awful lot more influence, control and power, whatever that might be, back in return. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I, I'd be keen, as I say, to, to, to hear other people's expressions. Please use the chat to, to if you've got any, any thoughts or insights to share around that. Um, I mean, I mean the, the Polanyi paradox that you mentioned, I think is fascinating too. That this 
concept about we know more than we can tell. And we know that's true. I mean, your, your example of you know, just your commute to work this morning, but the, you know, I've, I've been working on uh, some a neuroscience program about brain and behavior in, in, in organization. And, and, and this idea that uh, it's not, that, that everything we know in the front of our, our mind has to have come through you know, the more primitive parts of our brain before it gets there. So in order for us to know something, we have to already know it before our, our executive brain knows we know it. Um, and, and I think, that, you know, and, and there's a whole extra block of content in there that we don't know we know, but we know it. Um, it uh, uh, and, and sorry, sorry, I would say as well that it's kind of, it's not a static thing, is it? It's, it's, it's dynamic because the advances in machine learning, particularly machine learning kind of technology stacks, is, is, is quite staggering in some of these regards. Yeah. So, okay, right now we, uh, we know more than we can tell and that, that that will be the case for the foreseeable future, etc. But there, there are inroads being made there and that has major implications. So I, I suppose one of the key messages, and, and this is kind of meant to be, kind of captured within this, within this idea of the DNA molecule of the double helix is that there's a constant evolution, okay? Because things are not going to stand uh, still at all. You'll remember from the last uh, webinar when I spoke about, uh, when, when I combined Moore's law with the idea of the, 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 idea of the invention of the game of chess to give it a sense that we, we're kind of seeing exponential growth. We can prove exponential growth in kind of technology areas such that we're actually on the second, the numbers mean that we're on the second half of a, a chessboard, if you will. And so this isn't going to go away. Uh, we need to become more dynamic uh, and explore more, I think. the Mind the gaps, as I said before, but, but, but also look into them and try and understand them. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, well, we've got some questions coming in, and, and please you know, add to those um, uh, as they ar arise with you. Uh, th there are a couple of uh, very similar ones, actually, from Subod and Adam. Um, I, I read out Adam's, but it, 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 it's very similar. Uh, how can you apply this thinking to influence the leadership team when there is more focus on increasing shareholder value? Um, so, so how do we get ABT uh, up into the top level of organizations? I think that there are, there are a number of, of, of different approaches that we need to take. I mean, you, you can talk about kind of, if we talk about the example given their shareholder value and, and kind of, you know, quarterly earnings and, and what have you. Um, I forget the number, but, but I read somewhere the other day, something like uh, $80 billion of kind of investment in AI, AI projects last, last year. Um, I didn't, get far enough down in the article to see how many of them actually delivered on their ROI, okay? But, but I know enough based on the conversations I have with kind of Fortune 100, 200, 500 companies to know that there is a lot of inefficiency in, in, in these projects at times. So if, if kind of if the bottom line is, is kind of so important, which of course is important to all of us, then we want to become more effective and efficient. What we're talking about here is kind of effective communication a way in which our technical and non-technical audiences can actually speak with each other and things not be lost in translation. The way that we can break down silos between tech and non-tech functions to create greater e efficiencies. We're talking about evolving our, our, our organizations into places and spaces where there are new opportunities. So I, I think, yes, we, we need to get kind of, we need, we need to get granular on the details perhaps, yeah? But there's no doubt that there's kind of business value to be created, captured, delivered, yeah, in these in these areas. So I, th I think this is um, it's, it's kind of a it's, it's a very real business type of conversation. What flip as is often the case in these kind of conversations, flip it around the other way. What if we do nothing? What if we don't evolve? What if we don't explore? What if we don't experiment? You know, why? You know, the classic kind of blockbusters uh, Netflix. Where, 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 where do you want to be with all of this? Okay, so I think all of us realize that we need to do something. The question is what to do. And I think starting from the, 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 the ground around digital language communication, the structure of your organization, where you're investing your capabilities in is, is, is very important. I mean, in your experience when working with executives, 
I presume you have a, have, have a, a range of seniority yes. of those executives, but, but you know, how they presumably embrace this idea of creativity. No, no one's against creativity, but um, the other ones that you picked out of your, your, your list of C's around compassion and consilience, are those harder sells or um, you know, do, do, do they get it? It's, it's um, to use another C word, it can be a challenge, okay? <laughs> but, or and, I should never use the word but, and, and there's something else that we should say here. Um, if you, I think if, if people are able to watch the webinar that we did just before Christmas, um, I, I talk about something called the reverse engineering model, okay? No, and, and this, this really is, is an approach. It's, it's, not, it's not scenario planning. It, it's kind of very different because it doesn't start in the present and march forward. It allows you to kind of create a desired future state, maybe 18 months, two years from now, and march backwards from it. And it, and it, it forces, that's a bit of a strong word, but it invites perhaps kind of all of the stakeholders to be responsible and, and to kind of be part of the planning and the, the time-framed action plan that, that comes out of this type of process. So what I'm getting at here is that a lot of those, a lot of the challenge kind of conversations I have are, are, aren't about people not wishing to embrace it. It's they don't, they don't know where to start, frankly, okay? And so, and they're, they're, they're worried that kind of in making a misstep, they might kind of mess things up, okay? And so I think, yeah, that, that, that's perfectly reasonable. And what we need to help with, all of us, we need to help with kind of the, the ideas that allow people to almost reverse engineer their future, to, to kind of understand that they can create the future, the future they wish, and these are the steps that you need to take in order to be able to do it, okay? If you don't do anything, this analysis paralysis problem of kind of data overload is, is very, very serious. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, challenging conversations, but whenever, whenever you've, you know this better than I do, but whenever you're in the realm of change management, yeah, th th there are gonna be some hard conversations, aren't there? And if, if anything, I prefer that it's governed by the bottom line because that gives us something measurable and data-driven with which we can start to, to, to kind of move things forward. Um, look, we've got a, a couple of minutes left and I'm keen to get through a couple more questions if we can. Uh, there's one from Mike here who's asking, the, does the concept of transparency play a part in this evolution? Um, it, it plays a, a, a massive part um, in, 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 a, in a number of different ways, okay? We, we haven't got time to go into kind of the philosophical kind of aspects of it. I'm not sure I could really do them justice anyway, but I, I want to draw them. I want to draw the, it particularly towards the question of algorithmic bias, which, which I think is a very important kind of question. When, when, when I hear the word kind of transparency, I'm only a couple of words away from thinking things like diversity and inclusion. Okay. Um, because as a result of the transparency, hopefully we can always find things that we can improve, okay? We can explore that and see how we can improve things. And the, the, one of the key things that we've got to do is, is really kind of try our very, but not try, do, we, we, we need to address this question of algorithmic bias. And one of the ways we're gonna do that is through diversity and inclusion and transparency, yeah? We can't have this black box kind of idea. We need to know what's going on under the bonnet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, and, and that, that sort of leads, a, I, I suppose, to another C. They, they all seem to start with C, um, you know, having, having courage to and, and confidence um, around, around being able to see, uh, enable this exploration uh, and evolution. Um, um, sorry, sorry, apologies to interject, but that, that's the thing, isn't it? Courage is always required to take the first step. I mean, taking the first step is always the hardest, whether you're going for a run. You know, it's, it's, it's harder to put your shoes on than it is to actually go for the run, yeah? It's harder to take the first step than it is to go on the whole journey, for, you know, and, and that's, you know, there, there are lots and lots of reasons for that. Yeah. And so do you, know, I mean, in, in the program, mm -hmm. is this the uh, work around enabling that kind of sort of mindset and that energy to, uh, to become sort of accessible most 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 most, most definitely i mean um uh, the, the, the kind of hopefully the defining the defining kind of common denominators of, of, of my work in general uh, are kind of around two things only um 
capability and the confidence to use it. Capability and confidence. No point having the capability if you're not confident to use it. it comes back to kind of what I was saying about languages. Okay, in this context, it's a digital language, but think about French, German, Spanish, Italian. I speak all of them really badly. Yeah. Um, but I've got the confidence to give it a shot and give it a go. Okay. And where does that confidence come from? It comes from the people around me. It comes from the support structures. It comes from the community. It comes from experience. Yeah, I'm allowed to fail. Yeah, to, to kind of one of the questions or kind of one of the points that, 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 that you raised. Look at, look at kind of what's happening at, at Microsoft. Um, permission to fail. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. important. Yeah, which fits beautifully with, with, with my take on leadership, which is around r risk and permission. You know, are, you, are you prepared to take the risk and does the environment give you permission to, to go in, a, in, in particular directions and work with people? Um, Let's see if we can squeeze in one more question. Um, it's from a Peter, a Peter that's known to you, I, I think. Um, if, if you are or get what you measure, how do you measure individual and team performance against the, the genes in, 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 the, in the double helix? How can people improve and get better at them? Is there a benchmarking approach? The, the, there is. And I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna, to evade the question a tiny bit but but not intentionally kind of um, I, I just because i want i want to make a, what, what i think is a very important point and it comes back to this kind of idea of of, of, of community and exploration and team of teams and, and, and teamwork um i think we, we also need to look at how we're actually benchmarking and looking not not just at compensation but how we actually evaluate people anyway okay in terms of their roles because unfortunately, at times, I think it drives the wrong or the not optimum behaviors, okay? So, so I think there's an opportunity in, in, in all of this to begin to measure human beings on these factors as well. Their compassionate quotient, creativity, curiosity quotients, a collaborative quotients, these types of ideas. And that's not just an individual type of thing, but within your team of teams, okay? When you have this kind of Jack Welsh or this kind of, you know, 70, 20, 10, type of idea. Um, I'm not sure that's conducive, another C word, not sure it's conducive to kind of where we really need to go with all of this, because ultimately it's about building trust. You have to have, you, people have to trust that the journey that you're taking, isn't this leadership? Yeah. To enroll people on the journey that you kind of need them to go upon, to, to kind of get them to come along with you. So trust is required. And so I, th I think there needs to be, um, a recalibration of the way that we look, the way we measure people, the way we measure humans, and the way we measure compensation and contributions also as well. So no, no shortage of work. To support <laughs> uh, fabulous, Paul. Well, we're out of time. Um, it always goes shooting fast. Um, and um, thank you once again for uh, sharing insight and, build, and building on what, what we had last time. Um, I'm will be we've we've recorded this session and I will circulate the link to the recording um, probably on Friday I think uh, and we'll include the link to the the previous session too for those of you who weren't able to join us there. Uh, but uh, all that remains for me to do really at this stage is thank Paul very much uh, and and also you know Paul if, if people want to follow up with you directly I, th I think you're pretty easy to find Paul McDonald Smith mm -hmm. at MIT. Um, it, 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 it takes you to your, to your contact details but um, uh, and the programs there. Is that right? In, indeed, yes. M Macdonna at mit.edu. Perfect. Um, okay. Uh, and, and so please, please do do that. And um, we, uh, we look forward to, to hopefully the third part, th third part of this sometime, le sometime later in the year. Exciting. Uh, Thank you. Um, so brilliant. Thank you, Paul, very much indeed. Uh, just before we go, uh, we are back next Wednesday with um, Brooks Holtham at, from Georgetown University, so a little bit further south from Boston, where, where Paul uh, MIT is located. Um, and we will be looking at um, the, the question of diversity, uh, developing a diversity strategy, so diversity from an organizational viewpoint, which in fact will build on an earlier uh, piece that um, uh, Professor Ella Washington did for us back last summer uh, from Georgetown too. So I very much hope you can join us then. Please go to the IEDP website to, uh, uh, 
to find the contact details there. But in the meantime, Paul McDonald-Smith, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.